Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Oliver Kolofsky, a wealth advisor and director of wealth services here at, uh, at Sweet Financial with you today for another edition of Sweet Financial Lives. We've got a, a market update here happening. So yeah, a couple uh, quick housekeeping items, if you will. Uh, if you have uh, questions or comments throughout throughout our time together today at the, in the chat box or the Q&A at the bottom, uh, feel free to type those in there as you see me look Look the other direction. I'm looking at my other screen to see if uh, what what questions or chat items there are, and uh, those will you'll remain uh, anonymous for those. So uh, if I read back the question, you won't uh, um, I won't read your name. So yeah, if you have questions or anything throughout the time, and if, I, if I'm unable to answer the question, I'll be able to see who who, who asked, and I'll I'll mention it, but I'll, I'll get back to you uh, individually. So yeah. Yeah, hope everyone is having a good day, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll talk a little bit about the markets this quarter. We're going to go back in time and actually come into second quarter a little bit here too, and then talk about a couple uh, a timely uh, planning items. So let's go ahead and, and get started. So we're going to talk a little bit about volatility, and we're going to look at a, a few charts here in, in a few moments. So when you think about volatility, has it felt volatile uh, lately? And we're talking about just the general general stock market, not not specific to uh, a specific stock or anything. So here is the uh, chart here, and I'll, I'll attempt to grab my pen here and, and and write on it a little bit here. So this goes all the way back to the beginning of 2022. So the chart begins one one of of 22. So over over two years of, of data on here, and why we picked one one of 22 is that was kind of was at the time the high point of the market or very, very close to it. And this goes, excuse me, all the way through January 3rd, or excuse me, March 31st of this year, so through first quarter. We got three different indices here we're looking at. So we could put more on the chart, but the chart gets a little bit busy. The purple would be the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The orange would be the S&P 500. And then the blue is gonna be the Bloomberg US Aggregate. Think of that as like bonds. So we've got two U.S. stock market, uh, generally the S&P 500, a little more tech technology oriented. And then we have uh, bonds. So not speaking uh, specifically to you know, like small cap stocks or international stocks. I could put those on the chart, but the chart would get pretty busy. For the, so, so for the sake of the discussion today, we're going to mainly talk about like large cap U.S. stocks and then uh, bonds would be the blue. So what we can see here is if we if we look over the last uh, what would that be twenty eight months or so, if you were to have started investing on one one of twenty two, you know whether you were in the S and P or the Dow, so think of like the U S stock market up about fourteen percent or so, whereas the bonds bonds you'd be down about nine percent or so. How much of that happened in the beginning of twenty two? So. That's uh, we'll come back to interest rates and and bond prices uh, after a bit, but sometimes it's good to just look back and see kind of where where we are because the stock market's been up a decent amount lately. But when we look back from its previous high in January of 22, it's really not up, um, you know, a whole lot as it relates to the stock market and the bond market. It's down a decent amount. So the next slide here is the same as the last one. But with one addition, we added another 19 days. So the last one ended March 31st. This one happens to uh, to go through April 19th. So we added what would be essentially right in here onto that, which would have been a downturn. We saw, you know, a, a pretty good downturn, or not pretty good, a, a decent downturn. You know, five, call it five percent or so. Here, when they came out the other day, we'll get mo more on this. When they came out the other day with the inflation report, you know that caused the uh, the market to to go down. So now let's 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 look at the same chart, the same three indexes, but from a different standpoint. Remember the last one we uh, looked at from one one twenty two. Stock mark, stocks are up about 14, 15%. Bonds are down about 9%. That was through the end of March. But if you go through April 19th, it's about 8, eight or 9%. Now let's look at it, the same, same thing, or the same chart. But let's start it like right, um, right in here. Let's start it like 
right around Halloween of 22. So that would have been like the low point in 2022, would have been the uh, kind of in that September, October time frame. I'm going to move this toolbar out of the way. There we go. So that this is the exact same chart as the one before, but I'm using a different starting date. We use that uh, October 1st, excuse me, it wasn't Halloween, it was the end of third quarter. So October 1st as the starting date, October 1st of 22 uh, through April 19th. So if we look at this time frame, we can see that the stocks are up anywhere from U.S. stocks up anywhere from 36 to 42 percent. At the same time, the bonds are up about 4 percent. So if we go back, for, um, so we're at like a year and a half or so from what was the low point, and we really haven't seen much volatility up until just a few days ago. I mean, there was a little bit of volatility uh, in, in here, uh, but again, what we saw just the other day was about the only volatility um, we've seen in the last, call it, year and a half. So from a historical sense, we're probably a bit overdue, if you will, um, for for some volatility. But for, for the most part, we haven't really seen much volatility in the last 18 months. As I mentioned, if we go back further, we saw a lot of downward volatility, especially in bonds in the beginning of 2022. So that would be a, a, a couple year uh, perspective. And again, there would be different nuances if we had like international stocks up here or small caps or mid caps or emerging markets or different types of bonds, like high yield bonds or government bonds, they're going to look different. But again, the chart would get super busy. So I think this using these three is a good, that kind of gets the essence of uh, of what has, uh, what has transpired. All right. I'm going to clear those. Uh, I'm going to see if we have any questions. Uh, yeah. No questions yet. All right. Let's move along. So we, if you've been an attendee before, you've seen this kind of mayonnaise. We think of mayonnaise kind of like diversification. Uh, it's kind of our, our thought process for investing. Uh, we like diversification. I don't know of anyone who just eats uh, you know mayonnaise uh, alone, but of course, if someone has a sandwich or a salad or whatever, they're going to have mayonnaise, or they may have mayonnaise as part of a, as one of the, the ingredients in that particular meal. Just like all different uh, you know asset classes, we have different weightings for them. But we generally, you know, like a a, a diverse uh, uh, portfolio. So let's let's dig into that a little more. Let's dive into the numbers within, like the uh, uh, the S and P five hundred or sectors, if you will. So this this is through uh, March nineteenth of this year. This would be if we look at the S and P five hundred. So that was the uh, one of the lines on on the prior charts. So it'd be five hundred of the largest U.S. stocks. Where are they from their all-time high? Like we know the S&P 500 is pretty close to its all-time high or would have hit its all-time high at the uh, at the end of March. But there are several items on here that are not at their all-time highs, which would be like real estate, uh, utilities, communication. So just because if someone says, well, the market's at, at its high, you say, well, well, which market would be number one and, and number two, like the subset of all, of that market may not be at the all-time high. I found that one's somewhat interesting. The next one um, is a little more interesting, I would say. This goes back to quarter two, and I'll grab my uh, the pen here, of uh, 2023. And then it's going to go forward. So it'll be quarter three, quarter four, and then in the first quarter, um, first quarter 24. This is going to look at the top three sectors Sometimes people will think, well, gee, is it just technology that always goes up, which is, is, not, is not true at all, um, especially in 22, we saw technology go down uh, the most. But we have seen technology generally go up uh, a decent amount the last uh, year and a quarter. But let's take a look. So if we look at the, the S&P 500 as a whole, that's always going to be on the right. So if we look at quarter four, the S&P 500, so the top... Three sectors, of course, would outperform the S&P because there's going to be other sectors that would be have underperformed the average. So the top three would have been uh, communication services, energy, and technology were the top three. 
And if we go back to uh, quarter four of 23, the only overlap there was technology, was real estate and financials. And then technology was not in, in quarter three. And then quarter two is technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services. So again, um, some diversification there. We saw real estate in there. We saw energy in there a couple of times. Of course, we saw real estate on the last slide that is, is down the most from its high. Yet in quarter four, 23, it was actually the best, uh, the best, um, best performer. So somewhat interesting in um, in terms of the uh, uh, the sectors we've seen the last uh, year or so. All right. Drawings. All right, no, nothing in the in the chat box yet. All right, we've got a little quiz for you. I'm not actually going to have you, you know, raise your hand or anything like that, but I'll let you I'll let you think to yourself. We're going to, you know, rewind to go back in time. And what we're going to look at, we're going to look at the top five largest U.S. companies uh, today. And we're also going to look at the top five U.S. companies in 1999. So I have two questions for you. One, can you name one of the five largest companies in the U.S. in 1999? That's question one. Question two is, are any of the companies, any of the five largest companies from 1999, are any of those five still one of the top five largest companies in the U.S. yet today, and I'm talking like valuation, like their, like what's called a market cap or their um, number of shares times their share price. So, if anyone wants to, I'll give I'll give you a few moments. If anyone wants to type anything in the chat box of what you think maybe one of the top five largest companies was in the U.S. in 1999, I'll uh, I won't read your name, but I'll I'll uh, I'll mention it here. Um, we'll see. I'll give you a moment, or if you want to think of of any of those are the same as in 2024. All right, we've got a few, we've got an Exxon Mobil. Uh, we've got uh, Microsoft, Apple, we've got a few coming in here. Yeah, guessing back in, in 99. And there's a point to this. I'll go through why why we're not just playing a guessing game. Why why we're we're looking at this? All right. Well, let's take a look. Let's reveal the answers. We had a correct answer, and there is the the largest company in 1999, December 31st, 1999, would have been Microsoft. And I'll grab the pen here. GE was number two, Cisco number three, Walmart number four, and Exxon Mobil was number five. If we look. Uh, today, 328 of 24, at the end of the first quarter, Microsoft, um, largest component of the S&P, uh, Apple, uh, NVIDIA, Amazon, and uh, Google, or Al Alphabet. Yeah. So what, what the chart up above is, is, is a, a few moving parts here. So the S&P 500, you hear that? You know, 500 of the largest U.S. stocks. Yes, that's what it is. But it's what's called market cap weighted, which means that it's not one five hundredth in each of the 500 stocks. But how big or how small a company is, that determines how large of a weighting that particular company is in the S&P 500. And what this chart is showing, I'll, I'll walk through it. It's showing that the S&P 500 is less diversified now uh, than it ever has been. So what this is going to say is this line up here, make sure I've got my pen. Yep. Let's first look at this orange line. The orange line is going to be those five stocks from 1999. So Cisco, GE, Walmart, Microsoft, and ExxonMobil. What percentage of the valuation of those five companies are of the S&P 500? So it was as low as kind of 5% back in 85. It's 10% today. Its peak was 17%, you know, kind of a late, late 99. So if you think about that, the S&P 500 at its peak and in, in call it 99, early 2000, that's 17% in these five companies. The other 495 companies comprise the other 83%. 
Yeah, so again, not not even close to one five hundredth in the five hundred stocks. So if we look then at at the blue line over time, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Nvidia, and Amazon was zero percent, or you know, almost zero percent. Some of the companies didn't even exist in um, in nineteen eighty five. And then now, if we go all the way out at twenty five percent, that's the highest highest it's ever been. So that's so that's saying these five stocks, twenty five percent. The other four hundred and ninety five stocks would be seventy five percent of the of the S and P five hundred. So one, a, a couple takeaways too. We want to be a little careful. We still like the S and P five hundred, but we want to be careful because it is less diversified than it used to be. It's more concentrated. Said another way, you know. So that's something we want to be aware of. Um, as we as, and the other thing is, it's more concentrated in like technology. Like if we look at the, the types of the companies that are the top five in '99 versus the types of the companies that are in the top five now. Um, I mean, we could get a few questions on like Nvidia, which um, if you if you could only go back in time, you know, own like one stock, um, you know, that would that would be it. So. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. So one more. So I had a few takeaways on that. One more, maybe just just for fun. I think we the next slide is going to go back to 1980. Anyone, any guesses as to the largest uh, company in the S and P 500 in 1980? So I think I'll show you 18 or 1980, 90, 2000, 2010, and and 2020. I'll give you a moment here. I'll clear my drawing so I can change the slide but a little bit of, uh, I guess, entertainment, hopefully, if nothing else, uh, on the next one. So the largest company in in 1980 as a, as, as a weighting in the S&P 500. We'll see if we, uh, uh, or the largest weight in the S&P 500. All right, not seeing any guesses yet. Let's see. All right, well, let's go forward. So here we go. This would be the largest U.S. companies by market cap, which means the, the number of shares outstanding times their share price, going back to 1980. So 1980, it was IBM. IBM was the largest company in 1980. Yeah, AT&T, ExxonMobil, uh, Atlantic Richfield, Texaco, oil companies. Yeah. It's interesting, IBM, I had a, had, a, had a person ask or a couple asked about I, IBM uh, the other day. So if we look at IBM, the largest company, 1980, uh, 1990, number three, uh, 2000, number eight, 2010, number eight, but 2020 is not, not in the, uh, in, in the top 10. Yeah. So anyway, kind of, uh, kind of inter interesting there. Apple first appearing in 2010, I believe it was. Yeah. Apple first appeared in, in 2010. A little, a little perspective there on uh, on uh, on things going back 40, 45 years or so. All right. Any questions, go ahead and type those in. Let's look at the market as it relates to historical geopolitical happenings. So this is going to go back to 1928. So uh, in a few years, coming up on 100 years. So this is going to be uh, you know, global conflict or, or global war. So we've got Israel, Hamas here in, uh, uh, this is through the end of 2023. Um, so what, what this is showing, this blue line is showing, if you were to take a look at like an S&P 500 index level um, and show that in essence, uh, you know, we have had, had some dips over time, but through all these various conflicts, wars globally, the market has still, uh, you know, prevail, prevail. They're going up into the right, like the left side of a mountain is up and in, up into the right. So, uh, kind of a reminder of all the, uh, you know, global conflicts um, you know, going back, um, you know, not quite a hundred years. But let's look at this closer. There's there's more data to be pulled from here as it relates to the stock market. So this is going to be U.S. stock market returns during uh, during a, a few select wars here. So I'm going to 
If we look at the, this is going to go back to 1926, so almost 100 years of data. So if we look at the blue bar, that's going to be like our baseline. That's the S&P 500. It's, it's returned 10%. 10% uh, uh, is the average annual return over the last, you know, just call, call it 100 years or 90, 96, 98 years. Yeah. So, but we, if you would have been with us last time, we broke down the averages, kind of like the average temperature in Minnesota is like 50 or something like that. But it's not because it's 50 every day. It's because it's you know, zero one day or negative 10 one day and, and 90 during the summer. Yeah, it's just like the stock market doesn't return 10% every year. It very rarely actually returns between, between like 7 and 12%. So, but anyway, the average return for a baseline 10%. The orange line would be volatility as measured by standard deviation. So the higher that number is, that means the more volatile it was. So that's 17%. That's our baseline. So if we look through the Iraq War, Gulf War, Vietnam, Korean War, and World War II, and we look at the returns of the stock market, uh, two, two of the five pictured here uh, had lower than average stock market returns. The seven there and the six there, three of which had, or excuse me, two of which had high higher returns. Uh, World War II and the Korean War. Gulf War was the, the kind of the uh, the average, if you will. But if we look at volatility, then it says about the same. The two of the wars had higher volatility. This one just slightly. The Gulf War, Iraq War, a decent amount higher. And actually, as as an odd as it may seem, you know, three of the wars had lower and a decent amount lower volatility than. Um, than the average of so the baseline of 17%. Yeah, you know, so we saw 11, 10, and 10. So there's uh some some context, if you will, um as it relates to wars or uh you know global global conflict. And uh if anyone really wanted to get into the numbers, we've got all the dates. So at the bottom, um all the dates that we used to uh to calculate these numbers. Yep. All right. Moving along. Yeah, inflation and interest rates. So inflation, let's start with that. This is going to go back to 1980. If we take a dollar in 1980, now we update this slide once a year. Last time it wasn't quite updated through through year end. Uh, now it is. So this would be through the year end 2023, a dollar, 1980. Purchasing power of 27 cents. Um, in 2023. So let's look at the year-over-year -year change in, the, in the, um, uh, the CPI or the Consumer Price Index. This would be like when they announced on the news, you know, inflation was this. This is the number. This is the number they're they're announcing. So it peaked at nine percent in. Uh, in July of 22, that would have been right in there, it peaked at 9%. So it's going going down since. Again, this is all, it's year over year. So you you know, you gotta be a little care, or you gotta be a little careful with how that's calculated because we already had a decent amount of inflation. Ideally, the year over year wouldn't be as high because you're already starting at kind of a high point. Yep. So the blue line is gonna be your year over year. The orange line is gonna be your three year average. Um, so this this is through February. So there's been one announced since this this slide, but three point two percent was the inflation number. So as that number continues to go down, the greater likelihood that there'd be interest rate cuts later this year, maybe several of them. So again, we've seen the three year average and it, it become horizontal or plateau and we're down a decent amount. In terms of year over year, I'm going to get a slide here momentarily. So, so cumulative, because again, year over year can be, I won't call it misleading, but um, you, you have a starting point that's already at a high point. Yeah. So the, again, the most recent one, as of the publishing of this slide, February was 3.2. And you may see where I'm going with this a little bit. The next slide would be... What happened here recently? Consumer prices rose uh, three and a half percent from a year ago in March, more than 
uh, expected. So this is when we saw the market, you know, early, early uh, on today, we saw the kind of dip here in April. And that would be uh, the main the main cause of this um, would be that it would be higher than the three point. We had hit 3.2%. We've been kind of going that direction. The expectation was from some that it would continue to be uh, going down and it didn't. So that's, whoops. So that's looking out at what int future interest rate policy might be. At the beginning of the year, some might have thought we'd see several interest rate cuts in, in 2024. Now some say maybe, maybe there won't be any interest rate cuts in, in, in 2024. But I would say the, uh, the inflation and interest rates seems to be a fairly key driver of the, uh, of the, of the markets uh, currently. This one we get asked about from time to time of the, you know, the inflation is this, it's 3 point whatever percent, 3.5 percent. But what, if we look at a year over a year, this is through February, the year over a year, where are we at? The top one is going to be housing, 5.77. The housing is kind of interesting thing kind of two things are happening that if we think of like economics 101 supply and demand um still demand there the supply is low in general i'm generalizing here it may, it may be different in, in different markets but if the supply is low that's going to keep prices high um and part of the reason some say that the supply is low is if people maybe got a mortgage a few years back and maybe their mortgage rate is 3% or a little less or a little more, it's tough to wrap your brain around, well, I want to move or put my house on the market. You know, I don't have you know, the cash to buy the house or or may not use my proceeds to, to fully fund the new house. I'd have to sell my house with like a 3% mortgage and now go get a mortgage at like 7% or so or a little north of that. So, so supply has generally been a little low, which has kept housing prices um, you know, a little higher, at least year over year. One we get uh, asked about a decent amount too is food. So food, it's saying two point two three percent. Again, some people say, "Gee, it feels feels higher than that." Uh, again, we're looking at a starting point of May of twenty three. So we're looking at, or this one in this case, February. So February of twenty three to February of of twenty four. So a lot of that increase um, maybe had happened prior to that. And you could drill down even further into the different, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables versus meat um, in terms of uh, of the inflation. Um, so this is the cumulative since since January of of 19. So five years is is what we wanted to look at here. And that, that's why the, the starting point um, was picked. So this is going to be, you know, goods 40 percent or so services, 30 some percent. Um, so this puts it, uh, um, you know, a little more in uh, in perspective of the inflation you know, at varying degrees, varying speeds, but this would be the overall or the cumulative percentage change. Because um, like I said, sometimes the, the year over year, you got to factor in where the starting point, starting point was. So that's going to be the cumulative, cumulative change in, uh, in pricing of goods and services. Yep. So 2024, of course, an election year. And if you were on last time, some of these slides are going to be a little bit of a repeat, but I think we have quite a few uh, new folks who didn't, didn't attend last time. Um, so we got we have a lot a large sample size here, almost 100, uh, 100 years, just, just under 100 years. Um, so what this is going to say, a lot, a lot of moving parts here, so maybe I'll grab the, uh, the pen here. The, this horizontal line roughly right here, that's like a zero. And if the line is up, that means the stock market was up that year. And if the line goes down below that horizontal line, that means the stock market was um, down that year. And if it's red, it was Republican in office and blue, uh, there'd been a Democrat in office. So a couple takeaways here. If we look at the first, second, third, or fourth year, of the presidential cycle, which has been historically the best. It's a third year by a pretty good margin. Third year would have been 2023. 2023 was a pretty good year in the stock market. It beat the average. So, so when they come out with these numbers or update these next year, the third year average is going to be even higher, slightly 
because the 2023 was higher than, than the average. Second best, fourth, fourth year. That's what we're in now. I would, if, if we were to make a kind of a, um, you know, an estimate or a guess, if you will, um, you know, we wouldn't expect to see any big policy changes proposed between now and November. So we tend to think that there's probably a decent chance, you know, outside of some inflation numbers, that 2024, the fourth year of a presidential cycle, would have a good chance of, uh, of being um, a, a pretty good year again. Um, so the next one is probably, I find a little more interesting. This would be every, this is gonna be the year, or excuse me, the return for the year of the presidential election. Again, going back to 1928. And again, if a Republican was elected, it's red, a Democrat was elected, it's blue. So key takeaway, I think 20 of the 24 years uh, provided positive, positive returns. There was a huge gap in here um, it was like from yeah, 1944 to 1996, there was never a negative uh, return in the S&P 500 in a presidential election year. The, the four negatives in here were uh, 2000, 2008, 1940, and 1932. Now, the last three have been, have been positive. So if 2024 is positive, it'd be four in a row. And again, we think about the averages. Remember I said the... The market rarely returns the average. If you say the average is like 10%, you know, the last three have been 16, 12, and 18.4. All been above the average annual return of the S&P 500 going back. I think that was almost 100 years of, uh, of data. So, so sometimes we get the question about, um, you know, the election's impact on, on the markets. Uh, I think... There'll probably be a decent amount of political discourse as it relates to tax policy going forward. And that'll happen you know, probably in 2025 because there's some tax changes coming up in 2026 if the government doesn't act. Um, but at this point, you know, we, like as I mentioned before, I, I could certainly be wrong. I don't see any big policy changes being proposed between now and, and November. And the market likes that. The market does not like surprises. So the stock market likes things that are that are known. So let's talk about some opportunities. Pivot a little bit here. So I've got some you know, good news for you. So you know, we talk about the markets, but you know, we don't uh, we don't have any control over the stock market or geopolitical um, happenings. We can control risk to a to a certain extent, but there are a lot of things you you and I do control. I'm going to highlight. A few of them in our last, I think we were scheduled to go until a quarter or two. So in our last 12 or so minutes. So, you know, things you and I control, you know, how you contribute or save. Is it pre-tax? Is it after tax or Roth? You know, if you're taking income from which account you take income and when is it going to determine your, your, uh, you know, tax, ta taxable income, spendable income. Those are not synonymous, not necessarily synonymous. You know, for when you start Social Security income, mention how much risk you take, from which accounts you take to give to charity, and when. You know, if you're age 70 and a half and you have an IRA, you're eligible for QCD, Qualified Charitable Distributions. It's getting a little technical, but most people take the standard deduction these days when doing their taxes. So being able to do the Qualified Charitable Distribution, or QCD, um, is very helpful. From a, a tax perspective, I think one of these, we did a whole episode or 45 minutes on, on charitable giving. Talk to your advisor about, about that one. As I mentioned, spendable income isn't necessarily equal to taxable income. You know, how and when you make large purchases, cash versus debt, and the, and the list goes on of things that you and I control. So I got a, a question here. I guess I mentioned Social Security came up here, you know, the, the question is, do the markets or does the markets, do the markets impact when a person might take social security? In my, I would say the answer is you know, probably not, or no, I would say when to take social security is probably a more so a function of your, your cash flow, uh, tax situation, and to a certain extent, extent I suppose, 
um, health. That um, you, you know, if you if you need the cash flow and you're, you're in a known tax situation, uh, it can it can make some sense. So I would say market happenings, either up or down, is probably not a determining factor in most instances of when a person or a couple would would start to take um, social security. All right. So one item I, I mentioned is from which account you take income and when is probably the ultimate controllable um, you you and I have. So we've got kind of five different buckets of money here, and in reality, there, there there could be more. These are the five we see see most often. You know, if someone has pension or land rent, that'd be a hundred percent taxable. So we've got that in red. Let's come back to Social Security. If you take it uh, money out of an IRA, traditional IRA, traditional four hundred one k. 100% taxable unless you give it to give it to charity if you're age 70 and a half or older. You actually have to be 70 and a half, not the year in which you turn 70 and a half. You actually have to be 70 and a half to do that. Then it's be zero percent taxable if you if you give uh, give some or all of your IRA to to, to charity. Yep. Uh, Roth IRA qualified distributions on a Roth IRA zero percent taxable. So those are are green. A non IRA be zero to maybe 90% taxable, depending what type of gains you have. And again, those can generally be taxed as, if you've kept it for more than a year, uh, favorable long-term capital gains rates, which for most people are at zero or 15% federal. The high enough income, it gets to 20%, uh, but we don't see that uh, a re a re real often. So, so that would be, again, from which account you take income and when, and spendable income and... Um, Spendable income and taxable income not being the same, that's really where where the planning um, makes a lot of sense. The other opportunity we see want want to mention this with with interest rates where they are is if you have what we call excess cash in in the bank, um, you, you know you want to want to want to be aware of what rate you're getting on that. So when I say excess cash, I mean you've got. Everyone probably keeps some cash in the bank for the month to month expenses. And most everyone kind of has a like a dollar amount of how much they kind of want to have in the bank. Is it they have some more, some less? But if, if excess, if you have money more than kind of your comfort level, you'd want to make sure you you know what rate you're getting on that. I mean, some of the you know, money markets or CDs or government bonds are in that, you know, five, five percent range. And it's going to depend on how long you go and what type of, of vehicle and, and such. But but some of those are, uh, are are pretty attractive. You know, we we for clients do you know, can do money markets or CDs, uh, government bonds, treasury bonds. If you do treasuries, um, there's no state or local tax. So for those of you who reside in Minnesota, um, that 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 can be a, a benefit. So so. You know, making good use of, of of money if you have excess cash in your in your bank account would be a good conversation to have with with your advisor of different options and which one might be might be right for for you. Got, I guess a question coming in here. Let's see how so the question is if you, if someone did a money market, how liquid is a money market? Uh, money market would be fully liquid. Think of it as like two or three business days. Where you'd have the money back in your in your bank account. Now, if you do a CD, ideally you got to hold that to maturity. But a money market is is going to be um, um, uh, fully liquid. Yeah, we just want to have a couple couple days to get the money moved. Yep. So yeah, that concludes the uh, the conversation for today. I wanted to mention so my email Oliver at sweetfinancial.com that does come directly to me, and if you if you feel so inclined with any questions or comments or anything, feel free to email you. I I will reply. Um, I've got time tomorrow and Friday, so I will would get a reply back to you by the end of the week if you if you do uh, if you email me. So again, Oliver at sweetfinancial.com. So I'll give another moment to see if there are any more questions. Just got one more question on the QCD or qualified. Charitable distributions. Is there a limit as to how much one can do to charity 
there's an annual limit. There's not a, not a lifetime limit, but there's an annual limit. I think this year they indexed it with inflation. It's $105,000. So you can do up to 105,000. Another one, Pop, does that count towards your RMD? Well, yes, when you're age 70 and a half, you wouldn't have an RMD. RMD is required a minimum distribution, meaning when you attain a certain age, you have to take money out of your IRA. That is age 73. So if you do a QCD, charitable distribution at 70 and a half, that does not, does not like count towards your RMD when you're 73. But it's going to lower the value of your IRA, which could make your Q, which would make your RMD less. But when you are 73, yes, your QCD qualified charitable distribution counts towards your required minimum distribution as long as you do your qualified charitable distribution before your RMD is fully satisfied. So I'll, I'll see uh, if you want, I can reach out to you individually on that one. Sometimes there's so many acronyms. It's like I, IRA, RMD, required minimum distribution, QCD, qualified charitable distribution. But yeah, they have to be done in the correct uh, order. If you took your full RMD, you could still do a QCD, but you're going to be taxed on the full RMD amount. That's that question. No, I don't see any other questions. I see some, a few folks have sent some thank yous. Thank you for the, the kind words. If I don't see anything else coming in, I, I wish everyone a wonderful evening. For those of you who are in, you know, Southern Minnesota and North Iowa, I know kind of all over, but a few of you, if you're local here, it's, if you look over my shoulder, it's like, uh, like sunny and 70 degrees out and, and not windy. So hope if, if you're able to get out and enjoy some, beautiful weather this evening. Again, Oliver at sweetfinancial.com with any questions. And with that, we will uh, conclude and wish you a, uh, a wonderful evening. Thank you.